Well, welcome back everyone and welcome to those who've joined us for the second session in the room and online today. My name is Shane Brainard. I'm the Deputy Chair of the UNESCO Australian Memory of the World Committee and um, it's a real delight to be able to interact with speakers in this second part of the afternoon and to um, help field some of the questions too from people in the room and people online. For people online who might just be joining now, um, you can propose questions anytime through the presentations via the Q&A button to the right of your screen. Um, and Adrian Cunningham here will um, help to select and pass those on. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the speakers who are presenting this afternoon. Um, however, our first speaker, Jessica Moran, does need to leave a little bit early. So we're going to try and fit in time for two questions um, after her present, immediately after her presentation. So um, get your thinking caps on. <laughs> um, Firstly, I, I would like to acknowledge the um, Ngunnawal and Ngambri people as the traditional custio custodians of um, the country on which we meet today and the country on which I live and work. I'd like to pay my respects to Ngunnawal and Ngambri ancestors, elders and community and all First Peoples and commit to ongoing personal acts of reconciliation. Um, and likewise, um, I'd like to acknowledge um, that everyone in this room today and online um, at, um, is, is probably joining from unceded First Nations land. And um, I'd like to um, pass that acknowledgement on there. So um, welcome to the uh, symposium honouring the stories of struggle, um, reassessing Australian uh, archives of disadvantage. Um, we have four presentations and five speakers uh, this afternoon, and we're looking at the question, what evidence is being preserved? Uh, I'll introduce our first speaker who has had involvement with a program in New Zealand, uh, well, with, with the preservation of a program in New Zealand um, that was actually a bit of an inspiration to our session um, today. And I think that will become clear. I, I don't need to detail that any more closely. Um, this is Jessica Moran. She is Associate Chief Librarian, Research Collections at the Alexander Turnbull Library, Dupuna Maturanga, uh, Aotearoa National Library of New Zealand. In almost 10 years at the Alexander Turnbull Library, she's worked as a digital archivist and head of digital collection services before becoming associate chief librarian research collections in 2021. She'll be talking today uh, about the project and the preservation of the project. We are the beneficiaries. Jessica. Tene kato katoa. He kai mahi aho no te puna mataranga o Aotearoa ko Jessica Moran toko ingwa. Um, and I want to begin today by acknowledging the Nanawal and Nanari people, traditional custodians of the land on which we gather, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Island peoples here today and to the Tongana Whenua of Aotearoa on whose land I live and work. Um, yes, as introduced uh, today, I'm going to be speaking about the National Library's collaboration with the We Are the Beneficiaries project. Um, but before I begin, I want to acknowledge that the work, the work of both Valerie Love, who wrote an earlier version um, of this talk, as well as Sam Orchard, who was a contributor to the We Are the Beneficiaries project, um, but has since then, to our great fortune, became, become a member of the library's staff. So he was also quite um, important to writing this talk. I'm going to ignore the something went wrong thing up here on my screen and just keep going. 
so in today's talk, I'm going to give an overview of what the We Are the Beneficiaries project was, some of the political and social moment that brought it about, and describe the work that the library did with the project to preserve the archive. And then in the spirit of today's seminar, reflect on the conditions that made this work possible um, and the responsibility that I believe that institutions such as ours need to be willing to take when collecting this kind of material and reflect on some of the ethical um, imperatives and limits for institutions of dominant culture like a national library when it comes to collecting information documenting the lives of people who have or have experienced economic and social disadvantage and oppression from that dominant culture. Um, so to get started, some background about New Zealand politics and how the project came about. Matira Turai was a member of the New Zealand Labour Party for the Green, the New, New Zealand Parliament for the Green Party, and she was co-leader of the party for eight years. Turai grew up in a working class Maori family and was a staunch advocate for unemployed rights, women, Maori, and marginalized communities in general. Ahead of the 2017 election, she gave a speech uh, at the Green Party AGM. Oops. Seems to be flipping ahead, there we go. She gave a speech at the Green Party AGM where she spoke candidly about her experience being a single mother on social welfare in the 1990s while studying for her law degree. She explained that despite being careful about her money, there simply wasn't enough to cover rent and food for her and her infant daughter. So she ended up taking on extra flatmates, which she didn't disclose to work in income. In sharing her own story of feeling forced to lie in order to provide for her child, she was advocating for a more compassionate welfare system and for greater support for families and children living in poverty. Following her speech, the hashtag I am Matira became, began trending on Twitter and New Zealanders expressed support and shared their experience. Um, at that time, the Green Party experienced its highest poll numbers during the election. Um, primarily at the expense of the Labour Party. <coughs> However, there was also strong backlash, especially in the media. And three weeks after her speech, Turai ended up resigning as co-leader of the party, citing unbearable scrutiny on her family. The Labour Party also changed leadership at this time, um, appointing Jacinda Ardern as leader. In the wake of Turai's resignation, Sam Orchard, an artist based in Auckland and shown here in a self-portrait, mobilized a group of artists to create art to share their own experience as beneficiaries in, hope, in hopes of continuing the conversation Turai had started. The artists depicted themselves in a few sentences with their experience and posted it online. This developed into the We Are the Beneficiaries project, which shared these visual stories via Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Soon after, soon after they were invited, soon they invited, mem invited members of the public to share their stories as well, sending in a picture of themselves if they wished, and write three to five sentences of their time on the welfare system, how they had been treated at a as a beneficiary, and what they wel wished the welfare system was like. When a story was submitted, it would be assigned to an artist who would illustrate it and then send it back to the individual for their approval before being published online. The work would then be posted as an image file with any text of the image written as a caption information so it could also be read by screen readers for um, accessibility of the content. Since its launch in 2017, the We Are the Beneficiaries project collected, illustrated, and posted over 250 stories on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter and is still ongoing. I think we're actually up to about 500 stories, the project at the moment, because um, this was written, most, some of this was written about a year ago. So each time an illustrated story was posted online, it would spark immediate engagement and discussion. There would be expressions of solidarity. Some posts documented current struggle would receive offers of direct assistance from the community, um, offers for mutual aid. Other times people had information about organizations that might be able to help. As this work progressed, the project coordinators identified a number of common themes from real life stories. These were benefits not meeting the current cost of living, dehumanizing policies, public stigma, 
and especially bias against Maori, people of color, single mothers, and persons with disability. However, there were also stories of positive interactions with the system and ideas and wishes for what benefits beneficiaries would like to see and what a better um, beneficiary system might look like. After several months, the We Are the Beneficiaries project created a report collating the stories, themes, and recommendations to the, labor, the new labor government. There was an official handover of the report in December 2017, as well as media coverage about the project and its work generally. Around this time in 2018, we, uh, Valerie Love and myself, then at the time head of the digital collections team, started having discussions about if and how we might collect the project archives. After internal conversations, we contacted the We Are the Beneficiaries project to inquire about collecting the digital artwork and other materials from the project and preserving the files. In addition to aligning with our strategic collecting priorities at the time, which were about born digital content would reflect contemporary New Zealand, um, the library was interested in this particular project for three main reasons. First, the We Are the Beneficiaries project was a grassroots campaign based on social media, which oper operated fully in a digital way. It, it demonstrated the ways in which people were communicating and organizing in the early 20th century and working for social change. Secondly, digital materials, as we know, are fragile and often ephemeral. And just because we knew the content was online now, that doesn't mean it it was going to be preserved. Um, and we, we wanted to act early because we knew about the fragility and the ephemeral nature of these kind of projects. And we wanted to try to collect the full context across the social media platforms while they were still around um, because there was no guarantee it would exist in the future. And we were really interested in not just sort of snapshots of what had happened, but trying to recreate that context of organizing online and what that looked like. Um, and thirdly, and, and most importantly, the stories and experience from the We Are the Beneficiaries project deserve to be heard and remembered because all too frequently are, they are not. And in analyzing our own collections outside of um, a couple oral history collections, there was very little where the voices and experience of welfare recipients were unmediated in our collection. So, the library very much aims for its collections to be reflective of the diversity of Aotearoa society, but we know we have a long way to go in order to make that a reality. Oh, sorry. There we go. <laughs> Delay. Um, most of the Turnbull Library's donors continue to be older, wealthier New Zealanders. Most likely, um, as we all know, and we've kind of discussed already this afternoon, they're the ones who have the resources to manage their personal papers and digital files. They're the ones who feel entitled or a sense of um, ownership that their materials should be preserved in an inst a national institution like the National Library. People who are struggling um, are in moments of crisis or are just trying to get by from the day to day are, are not usually, not always, but um, are not usually the ones thinking about their historical legacy and if and how it will be remembered. So for libraries and archives, we really need to do more than um, just understand the significance of the material that's being offered to us or is coming to us, but to think more broadly um, around the context of the records that aren't being offered or aren't even being considered for archives or worthy of the archive. Um, so that was part of what we were really thinking about when we first started talking to this project. As I mentioned, the Turnbull Library did have oral histories from a small number of social workers, women in welfare work, as well as um, some oral histories of actual experiences of people um, living on welfare. However, most of the records uh, around social welfare in the collections were from political parties, um, individual politicians, or others who were working at more of the kind of uh, systematic and structural. They weren't the stories um, coming directly from people. Um, and one area where we did actually have a stronger uh, representation of beneficiaries was in the archive of New Zealand political cartoons. Um, but here, 
uh, people on social welfare were mostly uh, the recipients of negative and some represented in negative and sometimes outright dehumanizing lights. So you can see a couple examples here that were from our cartoon archive. Um, and these were created by professional editorial cartoonists and rely on um, biased and you know, harmful stereotypes of what it's like and who is a beneficiary. So when we contacted the We Are the Beneficiary project, the organizers were enthusiastic about the library preserving their work. As a completely grassroots project, collaboration and partnership underpin the project from the start. The library strove to ensure that we continue that spirit of collaboration and partnership between the project and the library as well. Um, and we really worked to use a model of shared stewardship as we figured out how we were gonna bring in this collection um, and what should be brought in. So we needed to do that work to build trust and to demonstrate not just that we wanted to preserve this contact, content, but that we understood and respected the spirit um, that the work had been created in. To do that, we made sure we had ongoing and open communication between the library staff in Wellington and the project founder based in Auckland. The project founder then liaised with the individual artists and the storytellers to ensure that they were not just informed that the archiving project was going to happen, but that they had the opportunity to opt out if they did not want their stories preserved in the collections. The National Library is part of the Department of Internal Affairs of the New Zealand government, and so it was really important to us that we made sure that people understood what that meant and to ensure that everyone had the ability and was empowered to say no if they didn't want their material in the collection. Um, and in the end, nobody said no. Everybody was happy to have the material in the collection. The project founder and the library were also cognizant of the fact that like the backlash against Matira Turai for sharing her story originally, that there could be unintended harm caused if these stories were made more findable by being in the library's collection and online catalog. We needed to ensure that those who had told their stories anonymously would not have their privacy compromised. So one of the things we did um, was we had a lot of conversations around access and permissions and making sure we understood what what people wanted and what would be most appropriate for the collection and the level of detail that should go into the finding aids, especially the online finding aids. Instead of describing each of the artworks individually, some of which you're seeing today, um, we described them as one large set of digital files. And part of that was to maintain the power of that collective voice uh, and also because it would be much harder to single out individual stories and experiences in the online um, because these artworks are available online through our catalog, but as one set, not as individual things that somebody could pull up through Google search. Um, and here is just a view for all the librarians and archivists in the room who like a good finding aid. This is a view of our finding aid of the collection. Um, the collection includes the digital artwork produced by the project, administrative files, including the spreadsheet that listed the artist and their assigned story, publicity materials, correspondence, uh, materials on, for the printed report, including the files in the different um, file formats, including Adobe Design, graphics files, different image files, um, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, video files. Uh, the social media archives were also received as downloaded zip files from Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And um, these contain JSON, HTML, JPEG, and uh, PNG files. One of the most challenging aspects of the processing and preserving part of the collection uh, was the social media archives. And this was um, for both technical and policy reasons. And I think probably for policy reasons more than anything. Within the National Library, um, up until this point, different teams had managed, published, and archival materials. And there was very different workflows, practices, and collection management systems in place. Um, however, we all kind of agreed that social media material was really straddling and blurring that distinction with elements that aligned with both. Um, and we needed to figure out the policies for the collection or where it would fit with our current policies before we could kind of make decisions on next steps. Um, and at that same time that we were working on this project, 
and sort of 2018, we were, we were really influenced by the work of the Documenting the Now project. And around the same time, in collaboration with Te Papa, uh, we had organized a public workshop on what ethical social media archiving looked like uh, with Burgess Jules and Ed Summers of the Documenting the Now project when they happened to be in Wellington for a conference. Um, we were also thinking about some of the work that Michelle Caswell and Marika Kifor had done on radical empathy in the archives. Um, and so a lot of these conversations were about how we could be honest and ethical and collect the whole lives of the individuals versus sort of social media, which we all kind of agreed was really interesting and had all this great text, but maybe wasn't a true representation of people. Um, so we held discussions and reading groups with teams across the library about preserving and describing social media and discussed the ethical, legal, as well as just practical impl implications for the library. Um, and I think this work was really important because it helped us all kind of get to the same page and have a common vocabulary for how we could talk about this kind of work. Um, and and it, it bled beyond just social media archiving to think about how we were collecting um, especially some of the work we were wanting to do to prioritize less well-represented communities in our collections and the kind of work that we needed to be doing to, to make strides in that area. Um, after robust discussion, we decided that the social media collections would be treated as archives rather than as data sets or published websites since the social media accounts contain content from a large number of contributors and can have additional complexities regarding privacy and copyright and access, we made a general um, policy decision that we would keep some of these social media collections available on site for people to use, but we wouldn't be republishing them on the website, and so they wouldn't be openly accessible online. So throughout our work to preserve the We Are the Beneficiaries project, we aim to uphold the spirit in which the project was created. And that was one of op openness and honesty, humility, and where the voices of the beneficiaries themselves were amplified and uplifted. The interactive and fully digital nature of the collection made it unique from others that the library had thus far received. And it illustrated aspects of contemporary Aotearoa that might not otherwise be represented in the library's collections. Um, as we've been talking about some this afternoon already, we know we have a duty to inter interrogate the gaps that we know are there in our collection and address those. We have to be honest about how they were created. The We Are the Beneficiaries Project Archive and other social media collecting initiatives have increased the faces and the voices in our collection and hopefully have started to allow more people to see glimpses of their own lives and experience reflected in the library. But I've also been reflecting on some of the complexities of this kind of work. Um, and I think I just recently read an article which I think really well articulated that, which was um, in Amer The American Archivist by Joyce Gabiola, Grayson Brimlar, Michelle Caswell, and Jimmy Zavala. Um, and the article's called It's a Trap, Complicating Representation in Community-Based Archives. And the article discuss, discusses the often complicated and conflicting feelings people from minoritized backgrounds and communities can feel when they see their stories in the archives. Um, on the one hand, it legitimizes and it makes those voices available and those stories that haven't been told and haven't been told honestly are there. Um, and it, it can feel empowering. But on the other hand, it opens those stories up to people who might not be receptive. Uh, it can put people who are from minority and oppressed backgrounds in more vulnerable positions, particularly when they're in an institution like a national library, to be honest, that is usually staffed by people who don't come from those backgrounds. They haven't experienced things like needing welfare for the most part. Um, and as we've mentioned above, we tried to take a lot of care to be sure that we documented exactly what we would and wouldn't do with the collection based on um, what the donors wanted and the access that would be used, who, who and how those choices were made. Um, and I mentioned at the beginning of the talk the ethics of this kind of collecting. And I think this is both why this work is really interesting and, and great to be part of, but challenging because how can we be sure that our cultural institutions, um, particularly speaking in my case, the National Library, which are there by their very nature 
institutions that are created and designed to preserve and reproduce that dominant narrative, which you know, reads as white, middle-class, settler, usually a white supremacist institution from its start. Um, are these the best places to put records like this? Or is it, is it ethically right for us to be going to those communities and asking, hey, give us your stories, let us, let us look after them? Um, and if we do think that they are the right places, then how are we going to make sure that not just the records, but the people's lives and culture represented in those records are protected, preserved, and most importantly, uplifted as part of this work? As um, I think has already been commented on and that I've been commenting on, these spaces, yes, like libraries and archives, hold evidence, but they also help shape and support a narrative um, and a dominant culture. But of course, that is just one story, and we've heard some amazing counter narratives and, and more fuller stories. So if we want to increase the stories and the voices in our archives to be more representative, we need to not just be collecting these archives, but creating everything from the policies, the spaces, the employment practices, and the services that we deliver so that they're designed to uplift the voices of the most vulnerable in our communities, to ensure that those communities and stories can be heard. Um, and we need to ensure that our collections about communities are created by those communities and not just reflecting the perceptions of well-meaning or not so well-meaning outsiders. But we also need to bear in mind that archives have not always been safe spaces. Um, and this information can and is often used against marginalized groups. So um, I think this is really important work that we should be doing, but we need to not just collect, but also adapt our library and archival ways of working to meet the needs of communities and start to adopt these shared stewardship models in order to safely bring historically oppressed voices in from the margin and center those perspectives. So I hope that we've done some of that and we've kind of moved a little bit along through the work with the We Are the Beneficiaries project and the relationships that we've developed um, and that we are continuing to take what we've learned as we do this work. Thank you. So, um, yeah, Jessica, stay, stay there because uh, there'll be a chance to uh, um, answer some questions. <clears throat> yeah, sure. So, um, so I have one uh, a question here from Brad Widger, who asks, do you believe that the marginalisation of Indigenous people is due to colonial biases such as, um, I think the inverted commas are implied here, we are more civilised people, therefore we must be better than you. Um, um, this is something that I have seen, heard regarding the Maori people of New Zealand. Um, uh, they were seen as savages and that uh, colonisation would therefore save them. Do you feel that this is uh, true also of Aboriginal people? Thank you. Uh, I don't know that I know enough to comment sufficiently on that. I would say that I, I would think that our institutions, not individual people, but the institutions themselves were set up as colonising institutions um, and that it's very difficult to go against those without kind of sustained effort. <laughs> um, anyone in the room have a, a question? <laughs> Jessica. Yes? Thanks for sharing. I was just wondering, were there any examples of things that you felt were not ethically right for a national institution to collect? Um. I think we have a lot of conversations. I think the ethics of it depends on um, the permissions and the access. So if we don't have uh, the permission to be able to, to share it, or we don't have the kind of the permission from the people whose voices there are to share it, then, then we're kind of running into really kind of ethical gray area. Um, and one of the things that we have been working through is is you know in thinking about protecting privacy, protecting cultural privacy, that if we are not sure about how you know the rights of the people in there and how it got to us, um, we can't actually get rid of it in the National Library without going through our uh, minister. So, but we can kind of 
make sure that access is either mediated through somebody who can act as a representative or that we can um, restrict access for an appropriate amount of time to protect people. Thank you. Mm. Um, we might have time for one more question. <laughs> that was fast. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was really, it's a great project. Um, my question is really about sustainability and a question came up in the conference about the ethics of something which was project funded, a website and then disappeared. Um, how do you see what you've done with this project sort of wrapping into your ongoing work and how is it sustained? Oh, that's a really good question. I think what's actually interesting is... Um, in an early version of this, but it was too long, so we had to cut it, is that actually, you know, the, the project itself, um, the We Are the Beneficiaries project, was all kind of volunteer grass, grassroots run. Um, and so in some senses, us taking on the ongoing preservation of the files was something that we could do to sustain um, so that that wasn't something people had to worry about into the future. Um, in terms of whether this work was done as a project, it was, it was like a mini project, so it wasn't, didn't have special funding. It was really our BAU work. Um, I think it's quite difficult. We have a lot of conversations, you know, libraries are places where there's usually not enough of us to do the work, um, and we're usually getting more offers for things than we have time. Um, so that tension between we want to go out and collect the stuff we're not getting offered from and do the research um, to make those connections and establish those relationships. And those take years and, and decades sometimes versus the kind of the people who know about us already and want their material in the library. Um, and so that's a constant negotiation of we're going to have to say no to all of these or we have, you know, they're not in our key priorities right now. We already have five versions of this. Maybe we don't need another Yes, it's really interesting, um, but we can't collect everything. And we made a commitment to shift our collecting, so we have to shift where our resource is going. It's not perfect, but that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you, Jessica, for giving us the, the insight into this um, archival innovation in practice, I suppose, and some of the ethical questions that it, that it turns up, that turn up as we start to um, kind of loosen and create more porous boundaries, I suppose, in terms of who has the agency around the archives that are kept and how they are um, presented, which I think will be a bit of a theme in this second session um, today. And it, indeed, as you were talking, I was um, reflecting on the ethics of all of the material that we heard about in the first um, in the first session, and um, indeed whether many of these questions were coming up in the collection of, of that material. So I, I think it is um, an inherently challenging area to work in, and I, I congratulate you for the work that you've been doing there. Um, I'd, I'd just like to, um, I guess. Um, shout out to the Australian Society of Archivists conference um, at this point too. Um, we're, we're at the end of the week of the conference and I'd, I'd like to um, thank the Society of Archivists for their very material support along with the National Archives of Australia that has um, allowed this event to happen this afternoon for people who might not be staying to hear this at, at the end of, of the session today. Um, without that support, this simply would not happen. The UNESCO Australian Memory of the World Committee um, does not receive any ongoing support at all. So uh, I think this is a really clear sign and indication of the interest of the society and um, the National Archives of Australia in having these conversations, in questioning current practices and in wanting to innovate and allow for um, for agency and uh, allow for a re-examination of the way these archives uh, concerning disadvantaged Australians are collected, preserved and made accessible. So um, thank you prior to ending our symposium this afternoon. Okay, um, now I would like to introduce a, a 
double act from the National Archives um, itself. We have Gina Gray and Phyllis Williams, um, who will be presenting around the theme of how do we decide what to keep. Now, I'll introduce both speakers now, and then I'll, I'll, let, I'll let them run one after the other. So Gina Gray uh, joined the National Archives in 2002 after 20 years at the Australian National University in a range of research and archival positions. She's worked in a number of roles across collection management, government records and information policy, and reference and access at the National Archives here. Uh, she's currently Director of Reference and Description Services. Phyllis Williams um, is a Gamokban from her father with ancestral lands in West Arnhem Land, and Larakia Kalambirigan from her mother with ancestral lands in Darwin and the Cox Peninsula. Phyllis joined the National Archives of Australia in Darwin in 1996 and has been in a number of roles since then. She's currently Director Aboriginal Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Engagement. In 2011, she was awarded a Public Service Medal for outstanding public service in driving significant reforms to communications and service delivery in the National Archives of Australia, particularly in relation to Indigenous Australians in the Northern Territory. Um, I think you can see they fit uh, the session today very well, both of these speakers. So uh, please join me in welcoming them, Gina Gray, initially. Uh, thank you, Shane. And I also want to acknowledge that we are meeting physically here today on Ngunnawal and Ngambri land, and I pay my respects to the traditional custodians of this land, um, past, present and emerging. I also acknowledge those of, um, those of you joining us online and acknowledge the lands on which you meet um, in, in that sense. And also acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us today in here, in this room, and also online. Um, as Shane mentioned, um, what Phyllis and I are going to do today is a very broad brush that reflects a picture that reflects what the National Archives does um, in relation to how we identify what we keep. What I want to do is first talk very briefly about how we do that identification. Then I want to talk about what we keep. Then I want to reflect a little bit before passing on to Phyllis about processes of review and reflexivity, um, how we respond, things like access and use, and the people who have a stake in what we do. Um, references to stakeholders are there, but I acknowledge that in that context, Stakeholders is a government word that I would probably in some respects um, choose not to use, but I will, so please excuse me. Um, so look, in broad terms, National Archives of Australia is responsible for selecting the most valuable Australian government records and ensuring they're kept permanently and preserved for access and use in the future. Our responsibility is to make sure that records selected to be retained provide evidence about the decisions and activities of government including those activities that impact people who receive or have received welfare assistance, services and support, or who have felt the impact or influence of government actions, decisions or policies on their lives. So how do we decide what to keep and for how long? How do we approach the identification and appraisal and selection of records that should be retained? As part of our policy setting, National Archives has endorsed four selection principles that guide that process. They are government authority, action and accountability, identity, interaction and rights and entitlements, knowledge and community memory, and Australians and their environments. I'll focus on, well, I won't focus, but I will mention the, the second and the third in particular, because I believe they have specific relevance for some of the things we're going to talk about today. So for identity inter interaction and rights and entitlements, what our policy says is that that principle is about keeping records that for individuals and communities reflect identity and the condition and status of Australia and its people, provide evidence of ongoing rights and entitlements, 
or show, importantly, the impact of Australian government activities on individuals and communities, as well as their interaction with government. That third principle, knowledge and community memory, also speaks to um, keeping records that have substantial capacity to enrich knowledge and, and, um, and understanding of Australians' history, society, culture, economy, and people. We say there, we select records with the highest significance and value to communities, people, and society. These principles operate together with an appraisal framework, though that's how we implement the principles, that supports the development of disposal authorisations such as records authorities. These legal instruments identify records that should be kept permanently and transferred to the National Archives. So you may know already that issued records authorities are publicly available on the Archives website. As part of the appraisal and selection process, National Archives analyses government functions and core business and, refuses, and reviews the types of records agencies create and receive. Agencies are required as part of that process to talk with all relevant stakeholders and identify any special requirements for retaining specific records. What I want to say is that the key message here is that National Archives decides which Australian government records will be kept permanently as National Archives and authorises how long other records need to be kept. These decisions are made with the input and agreement of agencies that create and control the records. But it is a negotiated approach. It's also the core archives' responsibility to make that final call. So in terms of what's being kept, I was thinking about how to approach this part of this discussion. I went back to the idea of what welfare is. The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare notes that while some people see welfare as primarily government funded income payments and welfare services, support and services in other areas of life are critical to wellbeing and that the two terms are often used interchangeably. The AAHW also notes welfare assistance and arrangements for delivering services are complex, multi-dimensional and cross-jurisdictional, in our case, case Commonwealth and State, with an increasing mix of non-government service delivery. Accessing services can be dynamic or they can be long-term. Wellbeing, and importantly I think, wellbeing can also influence and be influenced by a person's interaction with services and formal and informal supports. So for National Archives, what's currently being kept reflects this complexity and also reflects what Australian government agencies are specifically responsible for in this cross-jurisdictional mix. What's also important to remember here is that National Archives doesn't have a remit to mandate the creation of records. We select as part of this appraisal process from the records that agencies create and the content of those records will reflect the business activities that they are created to support. It's this primary business purpose that determines the nature and content of agency records. We do have scope to influence the quality of records, for example, through requiring agencies to implement metadata standards to ensure sufficient information is created and maintained to secure the provenance of the record and support preservation. We can also broadly encourage agencies to create records to ensure evidence of their business activities. I guess any of you who might have had interaction with the um, Australian government, the Commonwealth government, or whose families or friends may have, or even if you just looked at our website, you will know, for example, that the list of agencies that I'm talking about is long. Particularly, I'll mention agencies like Department of Veterans Affairs, Health, Comcare, the National Disability Insurance Agency, Department of Human Services, Department of Social Services, and the Department of Home Affairs. But that's only a very quick list of perhaps what could be described as the big Commonwealth players in this space. The sort of records that they create are a multiplicity. They include medical and hospital and advocacy case files, individual case files resulting from health emergencies, records about applications of eligibility for uh, access to healthcare services, case records relating to asbestos exposure, 
provider or worker case files relating to non-compliance, perhaps in the NDIA space. Um, summary, individual client data. Um, records about individuals who have be, been detained in, in immigration detention, migrant hostels, um, and wartime internment, passenger arrival information, citizen and migration case files, including for refugees and asylum seekers. What I want to recognise and acknowledge here is that many of those records have a limited capacity to and don't address how lived experience, voice and individual achievements and life course should or can be documented. The exception here, I think, though, is records that are created um, by inquiries and royal commissions, where very often the nature of those inquiries and royal commissions provides a voice for individuals. I think of the current royal commissions that we are aware of, those that are, that are recently just concluded, but also going back, for example, to the Royal Commission on Human Relationships in the 1970s, which itself was a groundbreaking um, Australian government endeavour. I do, though, think that the other records that we've just been talking about do realise some of those aspects of wellbeing that relate to the influences of interaction with services and supports and can form part of the mosaic of individuals' broader life experience. They potentially allow for um, a reading between or in the margins and create some sense of the view of the whole person. What I want to turn to now quickly is and return briefly to those who have a stake in the records that are being created, but I also want to talk about how National Archives can and does respond to change by reviewing or amending selection decisions and in some cases suspending existing permissions to destroy records. I mentioned earlier that our appraisal methodology requires agencies to identify all stakeholders and identify and document their particular interests in the records created by the agency. Under that methodology, agencies need to identify and consult to ensure interests are represented. The level of involvement will vary depending on the nature of the agency, the role of the stakeholder and the sensitivity of the records. The process goes so that the agency incorporates the outcomes of this research and consultation into its submission, which National Archives then assesses. We can and do ask for additional information and clarification, including from particular stakeholder groups. So what this bold, um, pretty bold process description reflects is that the effectiveness of records authorities to ensure that the right records are preserved rests and depends on how well they reflect or mirror the needs, rights, entitlements, interests of a range of groups. It also reflects that appraisal and selection that leads to the issuing of a records authority happens at a point in time. However, appraisal is and should be a dynamic and reflexive process. For National Archives, what this means, in part, is that a range of triggers, so significant events, including inquiries and royal commissions, legal proceedings, changes in policy, decisions or requirements to access entitlements, or more particularly, evidence of access and use from individuals and groups, provides the impetus for us to respond in real time to significant societal shifts and government actions that affect decisions about records retention. In those specific circumstances, National Archives issues disposal freezes and records retention notices that respond to these significant shifts and decisions. Current notices and freezes, again available on our website, include those for records relating to current and past royal commissions, as well as the rights and entitlements of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, the robo-debt scheme, national disaster arrangements, and very significantly, the use of fire suppressants and the current legal proceedings that are, that are ongoing in various states and territories. That's only a selection. What I want to say is that these responses address actions agencies need to take for records still in their custody, but they can be and are also used to inform archives internal review of records 
that were appraised and transferred into our custody under earlier disposal regimes and processes. This sort of legacy review acknowledges shifting and long form significance for older records that come into prominence and visibility because of recent government decisions, actions and policies, and also allows us to ensure that they are preserved for the future. So what I want to say is that, in fi in finally, before I hand over to Phyllis, is that understanding more about what access and use of records tells us about shifts in significance and value is also an increasingly important part of this reflexive response and is directly related to National Archives' responsibility to provide public access. I'll leave you with a small but important example of that response in the inclusion of a in the Department of the Human Services Records Authority of name identified records documenting 20th century payments and services to institutions which were responsible for the care of either child or migrants or forgotten Australians. These records would formerly have been seen as transactional. Through that action, as a small but significant action, those records we now preserve where they currently exist. So I'll now hand over to Phyllis, who's going to continue this discussion with a particular focus on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and the records that relate to them. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people on whose lands I am at us are on today. I also acknowledge their elders, past, present and emerging. I also acknowledge other Indigenous people here today and also others who have joined us, uh, joined the symposium online today. In 2020, when National Archives principles for selecting the Australian Government National Archives was being reviewed, Indigenous staff from across the organisation had discussion with our Government Records Assurance about the principles to incorporate Indigenous perspectives into each of our collecting principles to ensure complete coverage. Conversations about the selection principles were in relation to native title, the Tandania Declaration, and the disposal freezes on records that could be accessed, particularly by stolen generations, and those people affected by unpaid wages, and in consideration of the Uluru Statement of the, from the Heart, Voice, Treaty and Truth. We noted and emphasised the experiences of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of removal and out-of-home care, the Bringing Them Home report, the Apology to, to the Stolen Generations and the Tandania Declaration, and that all these point to records which are highly valued and important in seeking democratic representation and redress for policies and practices by Indigenous peoples. We also expressed and emphasised Indigenous perspectives and the experiences and issues highlighted and records to support Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, importantly are human rights and must be included. Specific examples discussed related to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples under each of the four principles, and I'll reiterate them again, is government authority, action and accountability, identity, interaction and rights and entitlements, knowledge and community memory, and Australians and their environment. Under the government authority, action and accountability principle, we recommended to include native title determinations as an example. Native title recognises Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people's traditional rights and interests in land and waters according to traditional laws and customs. Under the identity, interaction and rights and entitlements principle, we recommended to include an example of records that provide evidence of community and genealogical links of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples. And this also covers particularly records for stolen generations research. Under the knowledge and community memory principle, 
we recommended to include an example of representations to the government for recognition and government reform by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, such as the Larrakia petition and protests against treatment by government from people. Examples of the types of records in the four principles which relate to or may be useful for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples current and future research include the decisions of the High Court of Australia, such as WIC and MABA decisions on native title and associated ju judicial papers, records that provide evidence of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and genealogical links, evidence of the development and performance of significant policies and programs and their actual or potential impact, such as the government response to the Northern Territory National Emergency Re Response Intervention, representations to the government for recognition and government reform by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, and records documenting joint management of national parks with traditional owners. These have, been, have now been included in our national archives, what we keep principles, uh, and that policy statement was issued in July 2021. Retention decisions and retainers national archives records are assisting to support people's applications for the National Redress Scheme, and that is for people who have experienced institutional child sexual abuse, Territory Stolen Generations Redress Scheme, for stolen generation survivors who were removed as children from their family or community in the Northern Territory, the Australian Capital Territory or Jervis Bay Territory, and the Victorian Stolen Generations Reparations Package, which is the Victorian package for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people removed from or separated from family. National Archives has also endorsed its assistance and support for the Healing Foundation's Historical Records Task Force principles for nationally consistent approaches to stolen generations records. We understand the objective of these principles is to promote healing for stolen generation survivors and descendants by collaborating to improve access to and management and preservation of stolen generations records. We have been working with and can continue to assist stolen generations people for more than 30 years. Before the Northern Territory Stolen Generations Reference Group's Going Home Conference in 1994, which brought together Aboriginal people who had been forcibly removed as children. The National Archives is aware of the Charter of Lifelong Rights in out-of-home care and has endorsed in principle support for the intent of the Charter and has done this also as a member of the Council of Australasian Archives and Records Authorities. Endorsement in principle acknowledges all Commonwealth state territory and local public institutions and care providers are strongly encouraged to commit to the ideals and aspirations of the Charter. And also that the capability and capacity of organisations to meet the ideals and aspirations of the Charter will vary. And that organisations may take different approaches to achieving this goal. For National Archives, there are complexities in implementing the Charter, as there are competing rights around the right to be remembered and the right to be forgotten, or the right to request destruction of records versus the right to retain evidence for accountability purposes and for potential redress or repatriation. National Archives will continue to implement initiatives, programs and services in line with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and reference strategies to people who have been impacted by childhood out of home care. These include responding to the Healing Foundation's Historical Records Task Force principles, the National Redress Scheme, the Territory's Redress, Territory Stolen Generations Redress Scheme, 
and also the Victorian Stolen Generations Reparations Scheme. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, we acknowledge not all expectations can be met under the National Archives of Australia's appraisal regime. It does give us the ability, though, to be responsive and reflective and to feed back to agencies and, importantly, that we continue to have the responsibility to do this for current and future Australians. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis, and um, thank you, Gina. There were um, some themes there, I think, that really echo some of the ambitions of the Memory of the World program, um, indeed, not only um, to provide access, but to um, ensure preservation of um, those records that, that touch on um, the experience and memories of um, particular groups, uh, nations, and indeed particularly um, acknowledge that those memories are reverberating and open and in informing decisions that are being made today. So um, thank, thank you very much for that, for that insight. Um, a reminder that we are now leaving questions until the um, end of our sessions this afternoon. Um, just before five, I think we might have the opportunity to move into some of those questions before our closing remarks from Ros Russell. Um, I was very interested in some of the comments um, on um, decisions around retention. Um, and I know um, that Jennifer Jerome will be talking a little bit about disposal as well um, in a very different class of records, I think, um, next. So I'll introduce um, Jennifer now. She began her archival journey working with records and library collections of the Adelaide Central Mission, now Uniting Communities, we've heard, heard from in the first session today. After completing a Masters of Information Studies, Jennifer joined the National Archives of Australia, working in both Canberra and Hobart. Since 2007, Jennifer has undertaken a wide range of policy and collection management roles with the Tasmanian Archives and Libraries Tasmania. Since 2018, her focus has been on enhancing the diversity and access of Tasmanian archives, community archives holdings. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer. Um, in this sem seminar, we've been looking at records of experiences of disadvantage and discussing which records have been and should be retained by national, state and community collections. So for this presentation, I wanted to investigate this topic from the perspective of the Tasmanian archives in our collections. I want to discuss the records we hold related to accessing housing, including public housing, affordable private rentals and lower cost mortgage housing. The Tasmanian Archives aims to be the repository of the documented heritage of the state of Tasmania. Our collection includes archival material from both the state government and the community. And one of our legislative responsibilities is to preserve the core records of the state. Ensuring that Tasmanians have access to affordable and safe housing is a core function of government. If they are to fulfil their role, the Tasmanian Archives should include a wide range of documentation around where Tasmanians live, the kind of housing they live in, and the struggles that they might have regarding accessing and retaining housing. Today, I wanna to give a brief overview of the structures that have guided how our collection has developed, how we've decided what to have and what to exclude from the collection. I'll give examples of records in the archives, records that have been included through both proactive and passive acquisition, through this, I hope to spark a conversation around the strengths and weaknesses of the Tasmanian archival collection as it records the lived experience of Tasmanians. There we go. 
Um, the Tasmanian Archives and the State Library both come under the banner of Libraries Tasmania. This situa unique situation allows clients to access both archival and state library items. And our collections are accessed by a diverse range of people, both in person and online. Now, many of our researchers want to get the facts and figures of um, which are found in most of our um, government publications. Others are looking for more in-depth or detailed information, something to give context and depth to basic data. And it's important to acknowledge that one of the most common reasons that people access our collections is for looking for um, genealogy purposes. At Libraries Tasmania, we create in-depth descriptions of our collections to explain why they were created and what they include. We also provide research assistance to guide clients to um, places, both archival and published, that might hold the information that they are looking for. Now, I won't go too much into depth on this because I mean, it is interesting as a comparison to the National Archives um, and what Gina was mentioning and Phyllis. It's very similar in Tasmania, obviously, we're a government institution. So um, we try and get Tasmanian government records that cover very similar um, elements to what was just previously mentioned. The authority and structure of government, the best evidence of government's functions and programs evidence of government and its influence on people's lives and environmental management and change in Tasmania. Now, in addition, we are committed to retaining records that can be utilised to check on and enforce government accountability and that allow Tasmanians to find the evidence they need to ensure that they are afforded the right, their rights and entitlements. Now, along with government records, the Tasmanian Archives collects and preserves community archives. The community archive collection is comprised of personal, family, organisational and corporate records. Now, we seek to include records that provide evidence of Tasmania and its people, records of significant Tasmanian events, and we want to reflect the day-to-day -day lives of Tasmanians over time. More broadly, we aim to include the political, social, cultural, religious, economic and natural history of Tasmania. Now, to grow our community archives, we rely heavily on proactive donations. Um, over the past four years, we have um, averaged 80 accepted new donations from community archives per year, and that's just what we've accepted. We've had more offers than that. Um, resourcing has seen Tasmanian archives favour a passive collecting approach, where we wait to be approached by donors, and it's only in exceptional situations that the archives is able to choose what we want to collect and then proactively go and approach these donors. The Tasmanian Archives and State Library collections include many records of housing and development. We have plans, application, building applications, family histories that do tell land, settlement and property development. We also have records of rental housing and rent renters. And if a person didn't own a property but rented a place to live or live with their employer, this is reflected in um, census records, post office directories, electoral rolls, as well as assessment and valuation rolls. More broadly, we have records that contain information on the financial context of housing affordability in Tasmania. These records include many facts and figures. Uh, for a period prior to the establishment of the Housing Division in 1908, government records related to housing can be found in three broad areas. So that's records about the regulation and development of land for settlement and agriculture, records um, recording management of and reporting on issues that come from dense infrastructure, such as drainage and environmental pests, and records recording overseeing a range of charitable institutions, residential facilities, hospitals and schools. So it's just a um, little bit of an example. You can find records for this period in House of Assembly papers, annual reports of institutions, correspondence of the Colonial Secretary's office, and records of entries in um, uh, registers from things like the Charitable Grants Department and local government records. Since 1908, there have been quite a few departments with housing as their core responsibility. Each of these government agencies or departments are required by the Archives Act and sometimes under their own establishing legislation to send permanent records to archives. The process of negotiating which government records become state archives is complex and we continually negotiate with government agencies to assist them in um, selecting records for disposal. We work together to develop documents, as we discussed, called schedules or authorities, 
that outline which of their records need to be kept permanently and those that can be retained for temporary periods of varied length. So here's a, <laughs> that's what these things look like. Um, generally, government records that are set for permanent retention include documents that give broad overviews of the programs and activities undertaken by an agency. Key types of records usually made permanent include policy documents, statistical reporting, significant administrative correspondence, meeting agendas and minutes, and records of compliance with standards. For records related to clients and customers of services or the staff that run a service, usually only registers or lists are classified as permanent. In-depth files, sometimes called case files, are often classified as temporary. This is usually because their extent is thought to be too large or their contents thought to be too repetitive or mundane to be of a higher long-term value. Temporary records are set for destruction in the future, which is anywhere from a few years to over 100 years. So this disposal schedule number 22 was issued in 1995 um, to cover um, housing records. And it has things, uh, case files and files of day-to-day -day management of housing are temporary, like house history files, which include the condition of public housing and records of the management of tenancies. They're both temporary. So researchers approaching government archives need to be aware that because of decisions around disposal authorisation, many housing related case files, so that's what they're coming to find comprehensive documentation of their family, a property um, or an individual, they're just not going to be found in the archives. When case files do exist in the Tasmanian archives, they're often not in full runs. And this is the result of re-evaluations in the 80s and 90s of records transferred earlier to the archives. So in this particular case, AB 106, which is Applications um, for Assistance and Associated Correspondence under the Housing Department Act, um, you can see that these records were sampled and what was a big run of records is now only um, one box with 16 files. So only those people are able to come and get access to their, their files. For researchers looking to find personal stories, the records of the Fair Rent Boards can be more useful. Established in the 1930s, Fair Rent Boards assessed applications from renters and landlords regarding disputes over rents. Uh, now, our records have um, both the application for evictions as well as determinations of the board. Um, the applications give a, win a window into the housing conditions of the time. For example, in many cases, landlords were trying to raise rents, and yet when you look into the application, you can see that uh, the properties were in need of repair or were not even suitable for um, habitation. Other useful housing case um, housing case file records that have not been sampled includes those from federal and then state government schemes put in place to grow the housing stock in Tasmania, for example, soldier settlement um, schemes. I just want to bri briefly give you an overview of one case file just to show you the kind of things that you'll find. This is from a series called Yellow Back Files for Premises Purchased or Vacated. And this was created by the Housing Department which, and this, so this larger set of records once documented all the public housing that had been purchased or vacated by tenants, and this covers 1947 to 1977. Um, all that remains is a small sample, just seven boxes. This example is from the Flynn family, and it's dated in the 1960s. Um, this is the only place that you really see the voice of the Flynn family and where they're explaining um, Rex, who's um, putting the application in his situation. It's basically him and his wife, they've got a small child, they've got, um, and she's pregnant, and the, where they're living is not suitable um, for them to live in, plus they're also about to get evicted, so they really urgently need some housing, and he's, he puts down that he's a, he's a milkman. So um, what we find later on in the file is, the file includes a letter from a doctor recommending that Elizabeth needs better accommodation, and it shows a certain agency of this family in that two politicians, two local politicians have included letters that um, are advocating for this family to get some help. So perhaps that just shows their situation was a little bit different. Um, and it follows their increasingly desperate pleas as they had their power turned off and they needed somewhere to live. And then it shows them one month later signing a contract for a property in a new development site. 
Um, and sadly, they only stay there for a little while and you see them four years later that they're having to terminate that contract due to health reasons and then the family disappear from the files. One researcher intimately familiar with Tasmanian archives, holdings of housing records, is Dr Kathleen Flanagan. Dr Flanagan made extensive use of post-World War II housing files in um, undertaking a PhD thesis and a subsequent publication, Housing, Neoliberalism and the Archive. I had a chat to Kathleen um, knowing her experience and her use of the archives, just to ask her what she'd felt about the kind of things she was able to find in the archives. Um, she stated that she did find value in the culled sets of case files that we had. However, she noted that it was difficult to use these files to tell the broader story of the housing department and its impact on their clients. Um, she mentioned that she was able to find broader administrative and higher level planning records to be useful. Um, and she found glimpses of individuals within um, different files. Um, what you will find is that those files are often, the administrative files can be quite thick, um, have lots of post-it notes, um, a lot of paperwork that's not relevant. And Kathleen mentioned to me that she, the process of going through large bodies of administrative papers to try and find glimpses of actual people uh, may be a little bit too um, daunting. And so for trying to find records of disadvantage, people may go to the more extensively held welfare case records. Uh, Kathleen also made use of some of um, records uh, such as the records of a committee specifically looking at eviction and problem cases. Um, she noted that records of the committee were useful in giving an insight into how government departments categorise and understand people regarded as problematic. Although they include names and addresses of people, the papers of this committee are currently open for access. And Kathleen discussed with me the fact that she thought that this perhaps saw a, uh, a different valuing of these records from the department that maybe they should have been closed and that re future researchers should be cautious in using that personal information. Um, Kathleen also mentioned that the informative nature, even though you don't have the stories of people, the comments included by staff are quite interesting. And they were demonstrating how the bureaucracy conceptualised and categorised tenants. And I thought it was quite interesting, Kathleen said that she gave a presentation on her research and that the public servants in the audience were quite aghast at the fact that in the past people have written that stuff down. And I thought that was quite interesting. So now, what does that mean about what we're going to find in files now? Hopefully it's a change in culture where we're more respectful or is it a culture where we're more aware of freedom of information and they're going to be a bit more cautious about what we put into records. Um, we also have records from... Um, the real estate industry, which is regulated by the government, and things like the auctioneers and real estate agents council. Now, I just wanted to mention that um, while the sorry, while the government was is responsible for these real estate um, regulators, none of those regulators have actually deposited any records with the archives. So it's that disparity between they've obviously created some records, but getting them into the archives as permanent records. So the only way to get access to what they've been doing is to look at their annual reports and newsletters. Oops. Um, currently, we're operating with Disposal Schedule 2501 um, to look at housing um, programs, which covers housing programs, tenancy services and emergency response and recovery. I just wanted to mention this because of um, something which is a little bit of a bugbear of mine with disposal authorisation is the term significant. And it's used in the schedule to guide records management managers to those records which should be classified as permanent and then sent to the archives. Um, it's very difficult to define significant. Um, and included in this disposal authority, you've got um, significant records of housing programs and tenancy programs defined there. Um, so they're more the kind of thing that changes policy or impacts um, the change of a program, steers a different direction, um, as opposed to those things which are just the everyday experience of clients' interaction with a service. So the, those records, which are detailed records of tenants that required intensive management, they're actually temporary under this schedule to, to be destroyed 100 years after the birth date of the tenant and other general tenancy management or transactional records are destroyed seven years after the last tenancy. 
So balancing out our government records, we have community archives. Some of the earliest community records um, are from benevolent societies and church organisations. The first benevolent society to be established was in Hobart in 1859, followed by Launceston in 1869. So the records are all in one series, NS1637, which includes minutes, assistance registers, with the very basic details of people assisted, and annual reports. And I did find, when um, having a look in the minutes, that it's, it's interesting that this note was put in 1933, that they obviously had some records, and in 1933 they decided, why are we hanging on to all these case files, and they destroyed them. So they were there at some point, and we got note that they were destroyed. So the only records that we have for the Launceston Benevolent Society is one report book of an inspector, and it's been digitised and is available online. Um, I've just given an example here just to show that this is the very little snippets of voices of actual people that you get within these records. Um, and this is a Mrs Huskinson who appears three times in the records, um, very, very... Um, judgmental assessment of her and her um, very inappropriate as they saw it lifestyle and um, which obviously was her just trying to survive um, is my interpretation of that anyway. So her voice isn't heard but we can reflect on the assessment of the inspector and his, his judgment of her. Um, also prominent in Tasmania was the Hobart City Mission which was established in 1852 and we have um, records including meeting minutes um, which give examples but don't go into great detail of the people that they were helping. We also have records of the Slum Abolition League, which is a small set of correspondence and associated papers, again, with no voices of the individual people that they were assisting. Church records can, also, can be a very useful um, source of information. They were pretty good record keepers and we have, in the Tasmanian archives, Anglican Church Records, Methodist Church Records, Presbyterian, Uniting Church, the Hobart Hebrew Congregation, Temperance Unions and the Baptist Union. So all of those records are available for people to access, um, some with various degrees of um, restrictions. We also hold the records of advocacy bodies such as the Tenants Union, the Tasmanian Council of Social Service, and even though they don't contain case files, they do... Um, document the advocacy work that was done to change social policy, especially from the 1970s onwards, and a change in getting government to take responsibility for housing, which was before that seen as something that was done by um, churches and social service providers. As far as the lived experience of individuals, we have a collection of day books and administrative records from both the Hobart's Women's Shelter and Caroline House. Caroline House was a supported accommodation from the 1970s to 2021, which helped women facing a range of um, life's challenges. We also have records from the real estate industry, um, and we don't have anything from the Real Estate Institute of Tasmania, but we do have a small number of real estate firms' records, such as Rupert Johnson and Roberts and & Co. So that their records are able to give another perspective. And just finally, I just wanted to mention that while facts and figures and the kinds of things found in reports, policies and registers are all useful when developing an understanding of the past. Um, of course, academic research, for example, relies on rigorous methodology in the collection and analysis of data. Um, there, is also, there is a general understanding that we need to retain this kind of record. However, what about the stories behind statistics? How do we access the voices of those affected by policy? Um, it's been my experience that case files show policy and process in action. They put the flesh on the bones of statistics, but they're um, voluminous, they're repetitive, and most contain unremarkable administrative activities. From my overview of the records we hold and those we don't, I've made the following observations. Um, I think that there have been genuine attempts to be objective and systematic in retaining records. Um, however, broad social norms, Personal bias and practical concerns have all shaped the records that the Tasmanian Archives has in its custody. Um, collections have been shaped by the ideas held by archivists and record keepers regarding what they believe future re researchers want to access. For example, many archivists, um, it's getting less, but it, there is still a sense of legitimate research and, um, and family history or other things. There's that balance between why we 
what we keep depending on how serious the researchers are. Um, and our collections have also been shaped by how our organisation has been structured. The amount of resourcing that is given to collection development and proactive collecting, and this directly affects the shape of our collection. So moving forward, the Tasmanian Archives will need to develop disposal schedules and collecting practices that balance these practical considerations with our, our social responsibility and the need to have a collection which does its best to reflect the Tasmanian community. Um, I wonder if we don't do this, then in the future, what sort of stories will we have of um, people experiencing disadvantage in Tasmania? Uh, and I've just put this up here to say this could be the only records we would have of individual people if we don't have this discussion about the kind of community and government records. And this is the media reports that um, fill in the gaps, but give a very surface representation of people's experience of disadvantage. Thanks. Thank you um, very much, Jennifer. And I'm reminded of Frank Golding's opening, um, some of some of the snippets of, of his talk where he talked about the importance of built heritage to um, the experience of people who have been in care and um, re you know, assessing their, their, their memories, which touch, touches on some of the records you're talking about um, there. And, and of course, issues of FOI and how that might affect um, records um, and indeed the redacted um, files that he, he showed so kind of tragically for people looking for information there. Um, indeed, so thank you very much. Um, and our next um, speaker, um, Cassie Finlay, um, will be touching on some issues of privacy, um, I think, as well. We are running just a little bit over time, and I'm aware that um, the good people at the National Archives who've made this space um, available to us um, will need to close at a certain point. So what we may do just to adjust at this point is we might forego, I think, our final um, Q&A session. Um, however, those questions that have been um, posted online, we, we will be um, taking down. Um, we are actually looking forward to the possible publication of a special edition of archives and manuscripts, including um, some of the presentations from this afternoon, and we'll certainly consider those uh, questions in the context of how, how we frame um, the session there. So um, I might throw to you, Cassie, I'll introduce you, of course. <laughs> Um, Cassie Finlay is a record keeping and privacy professional with over 20 years operational and management experience in government and corporate environments. She is a principal with 11M, a Sydney based privacy information management and cybersecurity consultancy. Cassie was the lead author of the current International Standard on Records Management, ISO 15489 and represents the Australian Society of Archivists in the International Council on Archives Forum of Professional Associations. Please welcome Cassie. Thank you. We're here, we're almost at the end. It's been an amazing afternoon. Um, and thank you everyone for sticking, sticking with it and uh, right to the end. Um, I uh, feel like my presentation is going to be a bit of a, a kind of a reset. Um, I'm kind of looking, I guess, a lot more at contemporary record keeping, but certainly with the with the view of well, what does that mean for the making of records, the keeping of records, um, and how it affects, in particular, obviously, people experiencing disadvantage, um, and. Uh, and I'm also, I, I guess, sort of talking broadly across all record keeping environments. Um, the work I do is in government, is in the corporate sector, is in not for profits, charities. Um, so I guess bear that in mind that that's kind of the context that I'm coming at this from. Um, so when I was preparing for this session, I, and I'm going to do, there we go. Okay. Um, 
I read the Canberra Declaration towards a representative national estate of documentary heritage. Um, and one of the items that that statement called out for was useful models and strategies for improving uh, the holdings that are uh, distributed national holdings um, and how well they were representing different groups and communities in Australia. And I think um, I was very glad to be invited. Thank you to uh, the uh, Memory of the World uh, Committee. Is that the right? OK, phew. Uh, and, and Adrian for inviting me, because I think understanding the privacy landscape, um, and it's, been, it's come up a couple of times today already, is so critical when we're talking about capturing and keeping stories through records. Um, so in this short session, I want to touch on a few privacy trends and also on potential law reforms that are coming down the track um, that have the potential in some instances to change the way we think about and manage personal privacy, uh, including for people experiencing disadvantage. Um, so I'm interested in the question of how to reach the goals of that Canberra Declaration while navigating this rapidly changing privacy landscape and how to do it in a way that gives people a say over the information that's created and preserved about them and how it is accessed. Um, so I'm going to look at uh, trends affecting personal privacy through the lens of record making record using and records retention and disposal and, uh, and, and look at how things might change as privacy law reform uh, hurtles to, well, doesn't really hurtles. <laughs> it's, it moves at a glacial pace towards us. Um, so um, I want to, before I go on, acknowledge my colleagues at 11M, in particular Jordan Wilson-Otto, who wrote um, a very detailed, thoughtful submission on the Privacy uh, Act review. Um, and certainly I'd encourage you to, um, to have a read of that and indeed of all of the other submissions from all sectors that were put in as part of that last uh, round of consultation. It makes for very interesting reading and particularly as archivists and record keepers. So you may know <laughs> that the Privacy Act has, uh, 1988, has been under review for some time. The coalition government announced a review of the Act and whether it is fit for purpose uh, in the digital economy uh, in 2020, just thinking about what Eva Cox was talking about, not fit for purpose for people, nope, fit for pur purpose for the economy um, in 2020. And then Attorney General Mark Dreyfus took up the cause when Labor won government in May. Uh, the Optus breach has strengthened Labor's commitment to seeing through the reforms quickly. So after originally pledging uh, that the changes would come into force in Labor's first term, Dreyfus now says he wants the reforms passed in the remaining, at least this was in the AFR a few weeks ago, um, he wants the reforms passed in the remaining uh, four parliamentary sitting weeks this year. Um, we'll see. It is well over time for these reforms. The general consensus amongst my colleague certainly is that the idea that individuals continue to safeguard their own privacy in this data-driven world is a fiction. In a very similar vein to the work done in archives and record keeping initiatives, privacy professionals are looking to redress the balance of power to give people more agency over their privacy choices. So what reform is needed in order to change this, including for people experiencing disadvantage and what areas are those with the most potential to affect record keeping strategies relating to these groups? I've selected some based on what I think, but if you look at any of the, um, <clears throat> the uh, submissions and the detail of Privacy Act reform, there are so many aspects that are under discussion. This is just a, a curated selection. So in the context of record making, I want to talk about notice and consent. We know that vast quantities are being generated and made today that are substantively made up of our personal information um, by corporations, yes, by the big tech, but also by government, by all kinds of organisations. One of the main tools in the Privacy Controls Toolkit is that of notice and consent. 
the idea that a person willingly and in an informed way opts into the collection of their personal information and by default the making of a record about them. The ability of an individual to choose when their personal information is collected is currently seriously undermined by the massive imbalance of knowledge and control between the user of the service and the provider in, I would say, the majority of cases. Research from the Consumer Policy Research Centre recently found that privacy policies do not aid informed choices and do not provide consumers with genuine choice or control. In 2020, 94% of Australian consumers reported not reading all the privacy policies or T's and C's that applied to them in the last 12 months. I don't think anyone here would be shocked or surprised by that. Of the consumers who had read privacy policies, 69% reported uh, accepting terms, even though they weren't comfortable with them. The main reason for doing so was it was the only way to access the product or service. People with less ability to navigate overly complex opt-in and out processes, uh, dark patterns and irresistible offers to exchange personal information for convenience are often caught unknowingly in the record keeping machines of these large corporate entities, uh, social media companies, online retailers and telcos. Uh, They're the sort of up there in the pantheon of meaningless consent cases that uh, came to everyone's attention recently was of course the Bunnings facial recognition uh, story which many of you would have seen where the, the, uh, the notice whereby they were, which they were relying on as default consent uh, for people to have their images recorded in that system was literally the, the kind of small notice, well, not quite in the basement, it was in the store, but uh, <laughs> visible to no one, noticed by no one. So what is proposed in the Attorney General's review of the Privacy Act to address uh, this, this area of notice and consent? Um, an express requirement under APP 5 that privacy notices must be clear, current and understandable. Um, there is no such requirement at present, so that's good. Um, the, the proposal is also that these notices include additional matters um, to what they are currently required to include, um, including the types of personal information collected, the purposes, the types of third parties to whom the entity may disclose the personal information collected, and if the information is, if the collection occurs via a third party, the entity from which the PI was received and the circumstances of that collection. Um, also information about how to access the entity's privacy policy. So it's, it's not a huge leap in terms of what those notices must contain. Um, I think it would be it would be nice if there were uh, if there were some levers there around uh, visibility and prominence um, and strong requirements around the sort of uh, timeliness of the sharing of the notice. Um, there are require there are there is a proposal uh, that um, more standardised, simple privacy notices be considered um, as part of a, a code under the revised Privacy Act. Um, and that consumer comprehension testing could be beneficial to ensure the effectiveness of the notices. And this is an interesting thing which we do sometimes, which is to use a standardised, a, a tool essentially that, I mean, it is kind of just a, an algorithm, but it's an interesting thing to read through a policy and it'll tell you at what level of education somebody has to have to read and understand the policy. Um, and it's surprising how often the tool, albeit it is a tool and comes with all of the, you know, um, you know says that you, you need to have a university level education to understand the policy. Um, <clears throat> so there is a requirement or a proposal to require that, um, to make sure that there is that timeliness. Um, so notification occurs before or at the time of collection um, and that, you know, if that isn't possible, there is a greater uh, onus on uh, the entity to say, why not? So I think, you know, certainly these are all good proposals. I think um, there could also be some uh, 
some uh, acknowledgement made that notices need to take into account the needs, capabilities and behaviours of the reader. And so that sort of goes against this idea of a standardised notice, but rather notices that are contextually sensitive and that um, take account of um, the environment, the, the purpose of the collection and the typical, if you want to say that word, types of people that are being asked to consent to the collection of their information. So that would require organisations to communicate um, in ways that are meaningful to them about the collection. Um, and I think this, this is an interesting uh, aspect of this for a record keeping and archives community, because this is something that we understand is essential to the design of record keeping strategies, is doing it in a way that is contextually appropriate um, and that takes account of the needs of those who are either subjects of records or users of records. Um, there is, there's some interesting examples of uh, research that has been done. I, there was one study done by Data61 um, that looked at consumer expectations, needs and behaviours in relation to you know, giving consent for the collection and use of data. I think that's a research area that could benefit from more attention. Um, so the next uh, element of record making I wanted to touch on in terms of privacy law reform is automated decision making. Um, and of course, I guess the most obvious example uh, of this that I would share is already come up today, which is the RoboDebt case, whereby automated decision making systems are deployed that have a very, very real and direct impact on people's lives. Um, and in that case, people, vulnerable people, people who were in many cases already um, experiencing disadvantage of some type. Um, so what the Privacy Act review is saying is that policies, privacy policies should include in uh, details of whether personal information that is collected will be used in automated decision making, um, which has a legal or similarly significant effect on people's rights. I think, um, you know, in conversations I've had with colleagues, this is, this is a good thing. I think it could be extended to um, a greater level of transparency by organisations on the logic and the design behind that automated decision making um, and some further um, exploration of potential consequences of the deployment of the technology. So it's really about holding organisations and the people who are deploying the AI tool to do whatever it is, more accountable because these are tools that are deployed by people. It's not a magic box that does something which is out of the hands of human beings. Um, these are decisions made by people to deploy this technology and so I guess a greater degree of accountability for its use is um, what we're uh, thinking is in order. Um, some, of the, some of the jurisdictions around the world, California, the EU <clears throat> do uh, permit or allow for people to opt out of automated decision-making processes and in a way that doesn't uh, discriminate against them or mean that they're unable to use certain services. Um, and particularly if you're talking about government, that's critically important. Maybe not as important if it's a fashion retailer, but you know, then again, we all need to buy a pants, so I don't know. <laughs> Um, and the third aspect that I just wanted to touch on in terms of record making is um, that the, the signs are all pointing to the nature of personal information changing under the um, revised Privacy Act. It's very likely that it will include technical identifiers such as IP addresses and other persistent identifiers of your online identity. So, um, you know, that means that collection may happen um, of your activity when you browse X or Y site, and unless um, the notice and consent and transparency bar is, is raised, that, that record making um, can happen without you ever handing over anything that you would regard as personal information, and yet you are profiled, and those records are retained every time you visit that site. It's the reason why, um, amongst other things, Europe has such strong cookie banner requirements 
um, that allow you to opt out. Um, although those are, you know, probably not, not that effective all the time because, of course, you have to click through and then you click through and then you're like, oh, I want this cookie but not that cookie. And, you know, the, the data shows that most people just shut it down just so they can get to the site. Um, okay, so that's a quick gallop through some aspects of record making that are relevant in the world of privacy. Um, in terms of record use, the most obvious um, example that uh, came to me, at least, in terms of looking at what's uh, on the table for the Privacy Act review is um, personalised marketing. The direct marketing provisions of the current Act were written in the 80s, where it was mail-outs <laughs> and catalogues. So things have moved on a little bit. Um, and, you know, people uh, who are interacting with the web, and this is a very, I mean, it, you could say on one hand people with higher levels of education are more cynical or susceptible to these sorts of, uh, and, and alive to the fact that they're being tracked and they're, that they're being um, targeted. But then, uh, I don't know, I, I don't have any data to back that up. But I feel like the insidiousness of targeted um, personalised marketing is, is a broad societal concern um, and potentially you know, people who are experiencing disadvantage could be disproportionately harmed. Um, so what it means to have your profile um, recorded and um, retained and stored by particularly, you know, retailers and providers of services is that um, once you're in there, you are, you are surveilled and tracked through a network of um, technologies that know that, you know, you saw this on Facebook and then you went off to this site and then Facebook gives you more of that and then suddenly all you're seeing is ads for, um, I don't know, um, cat harnesses in my case. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and, you know, and, and the, that is an, inter you know, the privacy is a fundamental human right um, and, and it seems like, you know, it is, this, is, this balance is not um, currently uh, at the right level privacy when you are doing your shopping or browsing online um, has really sort of gone away unless you know how to use the sort of tools that can hide your online existence. Um, increasingly we're seeing profiling that is done around behavioural demographic or instant interest-based profiles but um, there is also, oh gosh I better go quickly, um, <laughs> there is also um, profiling that is done that doesn't use data that comes directly from you but is from data brokers where you, your profile is appended with information that might be anything from, we think this person comes from another country. I've even seen in, in data broker catalogues things like assimilation score. How, how assimilated is this person who is not from this country into this country? Really creepy stuff. And you wonder, well, what, what is that used for in terms of selling me a barbecue? Um, <clears throat> so there are questions of fairness, there are questions of having a profile about you that is retained um, by a corporate entity that, you know, is, is fundamentally untrue or, or is just creepy. Um, <clears throat> oh, hang on. Okay. Um, I briefly mentioned data brokers. Um, I will just say that there are proposals under this um, review to adopt a much stronger um, degree of transparency and reportability about the use of data brokers. Um, these are companies that essentially scrape um, publicly available sources and also use dark magic to arrive at profiles for different people and different groups. Um, and so if, if those kinds of uh, brokers are used, the idea is that you have to be very transparent about it. Um, and indeed, if you sell personal information, you have to, um, well, under the proposal, you would have to actually um, disclose that. All right, galloping home. So the last area I wanted to touch on was retention and dis disposal. Um, there are a couple of elements in the privacy law reform that I think are worth keeping track of in, uh, as record keepers and archivists. Um, much stronger requirements to destroy or to de-identify. Um, now, of course, there are exceptions there for public records um, and there are other exceptions, but I think it's interesting from a non-government and you know, other kinds of organisations' point of view that there, is going to be, there are going to be stronger requirements 
um, on organisations where records contain personal information to destroy those records or to de-identify them. And uh, what does that mean? What does that mean in terms of the future archival record? And finally, and I think this was something that came up uh, during the conference this week, um, in Europe, it's called the right to be forgotten. The Privacy Act review talk, talks about the right to erasure, um, where you know, the proposal is that individuals are given a right um, to request that information held about them by an APP entity is permanently destroyed, deleted, uh, or de-identified. Um, there are certain sort of, there's a bit of a conversation going around any exceptions to that. Obviously, in the case of government records, there is an overriding requirement to retain that um, record, then that may uh, supersede the deletion request. But that's one to watch, I would suggest. Um, you know, I think some, both of these provisions could have uh, quite an impact on the nature of records of individuals um, that uh, we find in collections in 10, 20, and further down the track in 20 years. So I am going to draw things to a close. And <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, I will say again, um, do have a look at the, you know, follow the Attorney General's um, review, have a look at the submissions, the ones that are from um, the social media companies versus the ones that are from, you know, advocates for privacy, make for interesting side-by-side -side reading. <laughs> um, so do that and, um, yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Cassie. That was a very illuminating and somewhat worrying <laughs> uh, presentation, but, but thank you so much for your, your insights and your ex of clear expertise in this area that's made us all a lot more aware, I think, of what can happen and, uh, and the provisions that are going to be put into place to make sure things, worse things don't happen. So thank you, we hope. Um, it's, we don't have time for a wrap-up of any extent. Uh, we're running, running out of time here, but um, so it's my happy duty to thank all the presenters uh, for all their wonderful insights. It's been a fabulous afternoon. Um, I think we'll all take away lots of things to think about um, from all sorts of different perspectives. And again, I'd like to thank um, Adrian Cunningham for his work on organising this uh, and, and my colleague Shane also for for having a lot of work to do on that as well. And um, again, as Shane did, and I will do again, thanks very sincerely to our wonderful supporters, the National Archives of Australia and the Australian Society of Archivists. We literally could not do this without you. And uh, I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Um, lots to think about, and uh, I guess that We'll all go home with a few different perspectives from what we um, arrive with today. So thank you very much.